Thank you very much, Giovanni, for introducing me. And thank you for inviting me to this interesting workshop, uh, Peter Spin Workshop. So I'm going to talk about magnetic skirmions. And can you see the next slide now? Okay, so first I will give an introduction into magnetic skirmions. And then I would like to talk about skirmions for reservoir computing, a work that we have been doing in collaboration mostly with George Buryanov. And now some new results, which I'm not going to show too much, also in uh, collaboration with the MUMAX team. Um, and then in the second part, actually, I would like to talk about a work that we have been doing together with a data scientist, Ilya Horenko, and also with my postdoc, Davi Rodriguez, who's also in the audience, and Terence O'Kane, who's a climate researcher. So this is going to be about data analysis, and we also applied this to magnetic samples, which I'm going to show. So let's start with magnetic skirmions. So magnetic skirmions were theoretically predicted already quite early on by Bogdanov and Labronsky in 1989. And the first experimental observation was around 2009 in the form of a skirmion lattice. So they occur whenever you break inversion symmetry. For example, to go here from the left part to the right part, you can either rotate to the left or to the right. And you can do this breaking of inversion symmetry either spontaneously or directly implicitly, and then you get only one type of skirmions. So by now they occur in many different uh, magnetic systems which have competing interactions. This you can understand just when looking at the structure, because if you go around the circumference here, then you want to have some interaction scale that is ferromagnetic or just favors an alignment. But if you cross a, a, such a texture, then you want to have a tilted structure. So therefore, they can occur in different systems, metals, semiconductors, insulators, bulk and thin films. They have been first observed at low temperature. These ones were, I think, around 27 something Kelvin. But by now, they have been found above room temperature, which makes them interesting for device relevant system. And also by mixing in these different interaction strings, so taking more of the tilted ones or so, you can engineer their size and make them larger and smaller. They can also be detected by various experimental techniques. And another thing is that you can kind of write and destroy them as you like. So you can create and manipulate them and also move them around as you would like to have. And sometimes you can think of them kind of really like particles. And they are more than just these simple skirmions. So there are lots of different textures that have uh, emerged uh, within the recent years. So why are magnetic skirmions or these magnetic textures interesting at all? Um, first of all, they can be rather small and they have been observed above room temperature. Um, this topology, so we are dealing with some topological magnetic textures. This you can see here a little bit on the right. So you can take a skirmion and kind of fold it to a sphere. Um, and thereby you see that you get a topological index of one because they cover one time the sphere. They do give them some additional stability. Um, what we have shown quite early on, so this was work during my PhD thesis um, time, that actually when you take a lattice of them, that they do react to very low electric currents. So 10 to the order of 6 uh, versus like 10 to the order of 11 ampere per square meter that you need for moving domain walls. Of course, if you want to move a single of them, then also the current density is higher. They also have an interesting dynamics because of the Magnus force. So Magnus force is something that you might know from sports where you rotate the ball and then a twisted ball bends around and gets some sort of banana kick. So here we have a similar effect. We have an electric current and these skirmions are not only moving straight along the electric current, but they get a component perpendicular to it. So that's called skirmion Hall effect. So they just don't move straight, they move towards an angle upon applied current. Um, and since they do occur in these systems that are device relevant, they might also have um, potential for spontronics applications. So if you think of skirmion based devices, let's say now we have these skirmions and we just want to build a device based on them, then probably the most studied potential application is the skirmion racetrack memory. So the racetrack memory was a suggestion by Stuart Parking, where you put kind of domain walls on such a track, so one dimensional wire, and you move them, and thereby you can store information in these domains. 
And then there was the suggestion by uh, Albert Fair to actually, instead of taking domain walls, just put skirmions on the track. And this has, does have some advantage. For example, these skirmions don't touch the edges, so domain walls might get stuck at if they touch, if they have such an edge roughness. But it also has this disadvantage if these skirmions just don't move along the current, they might move upwards, and then eventually they might crash into these walls. There are several suggestions on how to get rid of this Skirmian Hall effect. Let me just briefly summarize this. So there are actually two types of suggestions. So one is a simple idea, namely using one plus minus one is zero. So the idea is here, you take one Skirmian, you take another Skirmian and they are oppositely charged. So this upper one would like to move to the left because of the Skirmian Hall effect, this one to the right, but if they are coupled, they finally only move straight. So that is one suggestion. And the other one is to use an additional symmetry breaking, for example, using um, anti-skirmions or twisted skirmions or in-plane skirmions, where you can play with the angle of the current versus the orientation of this additional symmetry breaking. Anyway, so um, still, if you think of just this concept, then what we have done is we took an existing device or device concept, and what we did, we took another magnetic texture and just placed the skirmion there. But you can also ask the question, what would be the optimal device that uses the properties of a skirmion? And in that sense, a domain wall is a one-dimensional object. So in the device concept of the racetrack, you only want to know where this domain wall or where these bits are. So if you just build large um, wires, then all of this in this second and third dimension is lost of space or lost of information. So you ideally want to have a one-dimensional device. But for skirmions, that's a bit different. So a skirmion, you can move around in two dimensions. And therefore, maybe a different dimensional device is probably better. So there are suggestions to kind of um, yeah, um, extend this concept of these one-dimensional wires. For example, here from Jan Müller or now Jan Marcel, uh, where you take a double lane racetrack, but still the emotion of these skirmions here is effectively one-dimensional. So we have been working on unconventional computing schemes where we kind of make use that these skirmions either can move in two dimensions or that they can kind of breeze or extend or that we use their uh, two dimensionality otherwise. So I'm going to focus on reservoir computing soon, but let me just briefly mention stochastic computing. So there's the idea of using skirmions for a reshuffler. So, and that's shown here as a very pictorial version. So kind of you put skirmions into a chamber, then you want to mix them around and then they enter at different times. So to build a reshuffler based on skirmion is what has been suggested uh, from the group of Julie Collier first, with Daniele Pina being the first author. And this has recently been built by the group of Matthias Kloy with Jakub Zatzvorka having done most of the work where you put skirmions through into a chamber and then they, because they diffuse, so they have some diffusive motion and then they exit at different times and thereby you can reshuffle such a signal from something like this to that. But now let's focus on reservoir computing. So reservoir computing is a field that has emerged in the field of artificial neural networks. And now it's kind of like a subfield of artificial neural networks. And from that, it has developed also into physics. So let me explain that. So in artificial neural networks, you have some input nodes, some output nodes, and you have some nodes in between, some internal nodes. And for reservoir computing, you call all these internal nodes, you call them a reservoir. And uh, these arrows here, which connect these nodes, are from the input to the reservoir only feed forward, so only one directional to the output the same, but internally they can be recursive. And it has been shown that under some, so they kind of found it a little bit empirically, that when they train such networks, then under some certain, certain circumstances, only some of these nodes or these weights have actually been trained. And from that emerged the idea, hey, let's not train this middle part here at all. Let's just train these output weights. So that's what people did. So they now keep this network fixed. So in reservoir computing, these networks are completely fixed. Um, and only the output connections are trained. And the goal of reservoir computing is not to solve something directly, 
but to start from a complex problem and map it into something that is then linearly solvable. And linearly solvable means easily solvable. So what is then the functionality of the reservoir? So let me just read it and then I try to show it in a pictorial way. So the reservoir projects different spatial temporal events into a sparsely populated high dimensional space where they become easier to recognize and categorize. So the idea is you have some input data and they live in some sort of low dimensional space and then my drawing low is two. And now once I put them through the reservoir and I'm going to show this a little bit later also a bit more explicitly, then they are projected into some sort of high dimensional space. And in my drawing high dimension only can be three. And in this three dimensional space, now I can only draw hyperplanes of dimension two, so really planes now in the three dimensional world that can then separate these data and thereby I get an easy classification. So what is it useful for? So we can use it for the classification of spatial temporal events, for example, speech recognition or sensor fusion type of applications. For example, when your car has different sensors and you need to fuse these signals to understand that a pedestrian is coming from the right or so. What are the advantages of reservoir computing? <clears throat> so first of all, we can train um, for multiple features simultaneously. So if we just think of speech recognition as an easy example, I can train for which word or which number had been said, one or two, but I can also simultaneously train for whether it was a male or a female speaker, whether it was an adult or a child. So I can do these things simultaneously. And another key feature is that I really don't have to know any detailed knowledge about the reservoir. And if this is true, then I can put a black box here and just ask what are the um, features of the reservoir that we have actually been using. And these are those that this, this mapping here was working. So that this one is a low dimensional space, the feature space is a high dimensional space. Um, we also need some sort of that this projection is nonlinear because if it's too linear, then these green dots will end up uh, kind of not separated from the blue ones. And if I want to do something with temporal correlation, I also need to have a short term memory. So if I summarize it as a physicist, I need a nonlinear complex system with short term memory. And this we have all over in physics. So um, this then allows to do pattern recognition with matter. And that's what people have been doing, for example, even with water buckets. And now the question is just what is the most practical system? So you can do it with water buckets, but probably you don't want to do computation with having a lot of water buckets in your house. People have done this with optical system. And here's an example from Julie's group um, who did it with Spintok Nano oscillators and she just gave the presentation. So before I tell you our idea, I would like to summarize this a little bit. So how is this actually working? So we are going away from this field of having all these nodes. We just need the effective concept. And this means that we have some input data. And the first step is that we bring this input data in some sort that our system understands them. So in my case, it's going to be voltage signals, but it could be anything. So it could be a magnetic field or whatever, whatever we like. So in my case, we convert them into voltage signal. And then we feed this through our system at hand. It can be water buckets, but in my case, it's going to be a skirmion system. And then we need to define what our high dimensional space is. So what are we going to measure or what are we going to look at? So if my system is complex enough, then I can define these spaces. And then in this uh, high dimensional space, I can do my data separation by linear regression. So what was our idea? And by our, I mean George Boryanov, um, who is working at Intel and myself. So we looked at um, skirmion textures and then we wanted to put contacts on them and then apply voltages across these contacts and then look at the resistance replies. So the idea that we had in mind was a little bit, uh, as can be understood in this picture. So whenever you have a river filled with rocks and stones, then the current would like to find the way with the lowest resistance. And the second thing is, if at some point the current gets very, very strong, then it might kind of excite or move a little bit these rocks and then a new water pattern would arise. 
So we started to look at it from a very simple point first. So we just had two contacts and we wanted to put one skirmin in the middle. And what we need for this concept to work is a magnetization dependent magnetoresistive effect. And what we use in our simulation is the anisotropic magnetoresistance, but in principle, you can use any of them because the details of the reservoir don't matter. Just one comment in terms of measurability. So uh, it has been shown that skirmions can be observed. So whenever you have a skirmion, then you can see it actually in the magnetoresistance signal. So it's not that it's completely out of scope in terms of measuring. So now you can take a single skirmion and then uh, we first computed the current flow through it with, uh, based on anisotropic resistance. And here in these last figures, we have subtracted uh, the current flow uh, from a normal one. And you can see that through a block skirmion, the current likes to go, whether a near skirmion it rather tries to avoid. So if we now pin these skirmions then, and apply current, then these skirmions want to move, but they are pinned, so they cannot, so they will deform. And therefore, finally, you get a nonlinear IV characteristic. So that's kind of the basic that we need. And now we want to go, of course, these resistance ratios are very small, so we want to go to more complex structures. So this is what we saw when we just simulated the current pattern, and you see that it nicely follows somehow this magnetic texture. And now we really started to take up a reservoir. So this is our skirmion reservoir with two uh, voltage contacts. And one thing we need to make sure that it's reproducible. So whenever we excite our skirmions, first of all, they need to be pinned. Okay, so we pin them through grains, but the details don't matter. So you can also pin them by impurities and so on. But what we need to make sure is that these skirmions don't just deform, they don't move. And that's what we tested. So we tested this under thermal excitations and also under current driven excitations. So they do deform, they wiggle around. So you might see this here, but they don't move fully. So because when we turn off the drive, it needs to be reproducible. So this is uh, now the result. So we did some simple pattern recognition first. So let me explain you this plot. So here you see time and then you see the voltage signal and we apply first a sine wave and then a square wave. And we look at the resistance change of the material across these uh, two contacts. And you first of all see that it behaves different to a sine than to a square. And the other thing you can observe that even the square signal has ended, you still have some sort of the resistance there, which shows you the short term memory. If you just apply one pulse, the signal is again tiny. So we applied a train of pulses. And now you see actually three curves. So the blue one is again the signal that we put. The red one is the signal that we observe. And the yellow one is the signal if you just would add up these single pulses. So we kind of did a linear reconstruction. And first of all, you see like after some swinging at the beginning, then the signal becomes large. So the texture do gets really excited non-linearly. Uh, one comment, you have to be kind of with your excitation frequencies, you have to be on the range of the material. If you're way too fast, then kind of your material cannot really react to the system. So it will just naively follow the linear reconstruction. If you're way too small, then this thing will end before something new arrives. So you will lose memory of the past pulses. Okay, so let's say we are in the right regime. And let's first do a simple classification by eye before we go a little bit better. So if we do a simple classification, we can see that we already have four different shapes here. So we, if I have a sine and a square, I get these kind of things. If I have a square and a square, I get this thing. But we can also see is I, I see this object here only on one of these squares and I still know what the past pulse was. So let's do this a little bit more accurate using like really, um, a linear regression. So let's say we do a time tracing of the signal. So we just measure the signal over this present pulse here now. And we want to know if we can recognize the present, the pulse before and the pulse even before. And for this, we write like the, the values that we obtained into a vector. And then we uh, call it a zero or one, depending whether it was a sine or a square. And then we train this matrix here. 
And these are the results. So as a function of resistance trace sample, of course, if I take only one trace sample, then I probably won't be able to recognize it. But with, I don't know, 10, I will actually have a pretty high recognition rate of the current, the latent, and also the past parts. Our system has also one more advantage. So we have more flexibility than just taking the time. So in principle, you could try to measure also locally. So then actually a single measurement of the magnetization is enough. And then you can also get information about the present, the past and the latent parts. And probably you need to mix these things um, and thereby you can even um, obtain a better value. So let me summarize this part. So what I've shown you is that you can use skirmions for reservoir computing. And the nice thing is that they are small and you probably have a low energy consumption. They are very complex, which for this type of application is very good. And what we're working on currently is also to have more contacts and uh, to find also more optimal settings. So I've talked about this uh, first part now and let me come to the second part. But for this, let me give a little bit of introduction. So um, we all know that we some, so need some new approaches. So what I talked so far was um, to use skirmions for unconventional computing or more generally to compute with matter or to improve hardware for computing, which could be spintronics based. And maybe some of these novel concepts require also going back from digital to analog type of information storing. Um, but if you think of it from a different perspective, then still tremendous progress has been made in computer science and particular machine learning. Even though if some of the basic ideas are more than 50 years old, there has been enormous progress relying on these graphics cards. Um, one thing, the field is still facing several challenges. And one is that something that we tend to neglect is that a lot of machine learning algorithms frequently have some sort of assumptions, Gaussianity and IID are the most frequent ones. And also they face a lot of problems in the sense like you, so most of the time actually you need large data for training or you might have these overfitting problems. And one thing is that not always all information is accessible. So here's one example where not all of the information is accessible. So that's the first picture of the black hole. And to be true, uh, honest, you don't see kind of the black hole. You see only the impact of the black hole in the data. So the latent effect the black hole has on the data. And in my personal view, this picture was possible, and it's a very expensive picture, but in short, this picture was possible because of progress in telescope and data analysis. So to be a bit more precise, so there were a lot of telescopes involved, and the data analysis tools that were used were Gaussian mixture models. Um, and I'm not going to go into any of these details, but just let me mention that these Gaussian mixture model um, do scale polynomially in the iteration cost when you have more and more data. Still, they belong to the most popular latent inference methods. And since most of you are probably not an expert on these things, um, they are, let me just give you a quick overview, if you just type it into Google Scholar, then you find 1.3 million entries, whether when you type in a magnetic skirmion, you find only 14,000. So what we have been working on is to develop two low cost tools and low cost meaning in that sense that if you have more and more data, these iteration steps that you need to do in your algorithms are independent of this data statistics size. Um, and we developed two uh, tools, which we called average latent entropy and average latent dimension. And they tell you something about the stochasticity and about the memory of the system. So first, let me give you one example. And these are actually really just tools. So you can apply this to any type of video data. And let me show you kind of a very interesting result from biology where we applied this to. So you see here a picture of a microscopy of a mouse brain. And what you're supposed to see is the flow of transparent fluid through the capillaries of the glymphatic system. So just as a background knowledge, so this is a recently discovered anatomic organ, which is responsible for the waste clearance in the mouse brain. But to be honest, you don't see so much. So let's take this video. So this one is a raw frame. 
and use a um, deep learning denoising algorithm encoder and then you might see a little bit of structures arising here. And now let's use these GMMs for, for example, where you also got the image of the black hole with. And then you actually see nicely the surface lymph capillaries. And with our methods, we could actually resolve more of these capillaries. So not only the surface ones, but we can go even further in the bulk. So this video was containing the information that there are further capillaries in the bulk present. So we have applied them to three type of magnetic system. One is the icing model, one is micromagnetic model, and one is magnetic imaging data. And the idea that we had in mind is we wanted to test it on a controlled system where we know what's happening, a little bit more complex where we can do theoretical modeling, and then on an experimental signal where we don't have full control. But first, let me show you one slide, a little bit of what is behind this method. So this method works on two data sets. And you are asking the question, how is data set X related to data set Y? And in our case, when you analyze these movies, then this data set X is the picture frame now, and the data set Y is the consecutive picture frame. And just in general terms, so X can have nothing to do with Y, so that's a Bernoulli process, so Y is independent of X. It can be fully dependent, then it's a Markovian process, or it can be something in the middle where you have some sort of latent process. If you want to put it in a different picture, <clears throat> then you can have different input values, different output values, and you can have some sort of latent variables in the middle. And actually the mapping from here to here tells you something about the memory and the mapping from there to there something about the predictability. So let's look at the two extreme cases when all these entries here are mapped to a single variable then all of my past information is gone, so it has zero memory, and then only the blue arrows, so the weighting of them uh, decides about the predictability, whether the other limit, all of them map over to here, um, gives you then full information about the system. Just one comment. Um, so this is a little bit the algorithm, how we compute them. So I'm not going to go into detail, but the, what the idea that we have in mind is that we do a little bit of a pass integral like form. So we don't allow only for one certain dimension. So only for one, but we allow for all of them and average over them. So it's like a pass integral, not having one specific pass, but allowing for all passes weighting them with their particular action or probability to occur and then sum over them. Okay, so what's the result for the icing model? For the icing model, we took a square. We took a square with a smaller exchange coupling. And you know that if you're below the critical temperature, then with a mean, calculating just the mean, you find the, the values. If you're above the critical temperature, then you won't find it because then your system gets disordered. But with our expected latent entropy, you can still resolve where this box is. And this you can do very good pattern recognition quality and still very cheap. So here's data statistic size and our model does not grow with data statistic size. So the result of the micromagnetic model, so here's one simulation. So I'm gonna start it and maybe you can find out where this little box is. So personally, I don't see it. So what we actually modeled was a stripe region where we changed the anisotropy. And um, if we look at our different tools, then here the mean can still resolve it, there, but the entropy also. And then we added also a lot of measurement noise and we could still resolve then where this box was. So when all other tools fail, Ours is noise insensitive, so even if you have large measurement noise, then you can still resolve it. So now the last part, the experiments, we uh, looked at mode data, and here's the experiment. So you see some fluctuations of the skirmions. So these are raw data from the skirmion reshuffler paper. And when we look at them with our latent entropy and latent dimension, we can observe that there are inhomogeneities in the sample either coming from impurities, or maybe you see a little bit of a color gradient in this latent entropy might allude to a temperature gradient that is present. We also looked at data from Axel's group, I think he's also in the audience, and these are uh, earlier data where the idea was not to look at these uh, diffusion. So here you can also see a lot of impact uh, 
coming from the sample, where you have uh, probably a lot of impurities or inhomogeneities in these samples. So with that, let me summarize. So what we have developed are two low-cost tools to extract latent patterns. You can apply this on any type of movie data. Um, and yeah, they don't have any assumptions. So they don't have these IID assumption or Gaussianity. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk and I would like to thank you for your attention.